Hi, everyone. I uh, am incredibly excited to be here with you guys today. This is super exciting. And I guess if it goes really badly, we can just uh, play basketball, which is pretty cool. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the next major step in transportation for cities. And that's urban aviation, or what we like to call ride sharing in the sky. It's a pretty atypical talk, probably, for Web Summit in the sense that it talks about a lot of physical world stuff. Um, but it's physical world stuff that was, is only possible because of the web, the mobile web in particular. So there you have it. Let's talk about cities for a second. They've got problems. Um, you've probably noticed. Uh, half the world's population currently lives in our cities. This is you know, half of a 6 billion or 7 billion population living in cities. And the UN projects that by 2045, more than 6 billion people are going to live in urban centers. That's a growth from about 54% to about two-thirds of the world's population living in cities. In Mexico City, uh, commuters spend five working weeks in their car in congestion, just sitting on the roads. That's five weeks of their time, working weeks of their time, they could otherwise be doing other things. Transportation is just not keeping up, and it's going to get worse. It's slow and congested today. There's inconsistent access for people. It's bad for the environment. So Uber is really on Earth to radically improve urban mobility. And that translates for us to fast, efficient, inexpensive, and clean movement of people and things around cities. So our initial insight was that ubiquitous mobile devices, these connected mobile devices, created a paradigm shift that enabled a new model that we call, ended up be call, you know, becoming uh, called ride-sharing. And we started with just black car trips, uh, but we quickly innovated because our goal is to do this for the masses. Uh, we quickly innovated to lower the cost of that offering to UberX. And in UberX, pretty much anyone can be a driver. And that creates an entire other side of the model that's super interesting, interesting as well, a new kind of work. The beauty of the model, though, is that we take an asset, the vehicle, and that asset in individual car ownership is, is utilized only 4% of the time. And we multiply that many fold. And this means that we can split the cost of that vehicle and the operation and upkeep of that vehicle among many people, thousands of riders over time. It also means you don't have to park the vehicle as much, because if you're driving it, you're not parking it. And that has prof profound impacts on not just reducing parking costs, but on the use of space for parking in cities. And this, in turn, allows for low transportation prices, which allows more people to have access to transportation. And as demand grows, utilization increases. And as utilization increases, prices decrease more. It creates a virtuous cycle. Uh, and that's very, very good for everybody. Um, and in fact, as we kept growing, we noticed that many of our trips were uh, beginning and ending at the same place and the same time. And we thought, could we combine these trips into a single vehicle? And it's interesting because uh, urban planners have been working on the, uh, this ride pooling or car pooling idea for a long time and have never been able to get it to materialize at scale. But we had a chance to do it for real, and we took it. And this became Uberpool. Uberpool, by the way, is live right here in Lisbon right now um, for 10 days during the Web Summit. It's kind of an experimental trial. Um, so Uberpool uh, drove the cycle again, this virtual cycle again, and allowed us to lower prices for riders once more, which grew the network and made the network more reliable, et cetera. So now 20% of our trips worldwide in Uber pool cities are, are uh, taken in pool. It gets up to 50% at peak times. So this is a really exciting success. And this, all of this innovation has brought us to this point today. Uber is operating in over 600 cities and 77 countries around the world. We have 65 million monthly active riders uh, taking 10 million daily trips. It's a pretty, pretty incredible scale and growing very, very fast. Though. We're still very much in hyper growth. And while it took us 6.5 years to complete the first billion trips, it took us only six months to get to the second billion. And we've now done over 5 billion rides. Of course, we're just getting going. Urban mobility is definitely not cracked by anybody, any stretch of the imagination. And in order to lower price even further, and at the same time increase safety, they're self-driving. This video shows our self-driving car on their test track in Pittsburgh and driving uh, and mapping the streets uh, in, in San Francisco. 
And it's just it's been over about a year since we started offering trips, self-driving trips uh, in Pittsburgh. And we've now expanded that service into the Phoenix area as well. And we've crossed our one millionth autonomously driven uh, trip mile. So back to this, the, this virtuous cycle, so we've got utilization driving costs down. Now we also have this, you know, this uh, other cost driver. And between the two of these, we're going to reduce the price so low on taking a trip that it's going to be significantly below the cost of driving your own car. And that is a watershed moment. That is when the, this is the beginning of the end of individual car ownership. And we very much believe that that's what's going to happen, that people won't own their, except for like a hobby, you won't own your own car. More cars on the network, of course, means that the network is more reliable. It means that you have short ETAs, push a button, and in 60 seconds, you get a car in many more places around the world. The whole system just becomes more reliable and more ubiquitous. So our self-driving team is hard at work to bring this technology to all of you. Uh, and really, it just, it's just a matter of making sure that it lives to the safety promise that uh, we're committed to. But even all that I've just talked about, even with self-driving, there's an upper bound of what we can do for urban mobility on the ground. And this is where it gets really exciting. Just as skyscrapers were the solution to commercial and residential density in cities, and by the way, this is a sweet video. I love this. Incredible to watch Manhattan being assembled before your eyes. Uh, we believe that moving local transportation to the sky is going to alleviate transportation density and open up incredible mobi mobility bandwidth in cities. So some time ago, we started looking seriously into this idea of ride sharing in the sky. We are very much a first principles organization. The way we build, the way we think about problems, we don't just try to pattern match or look around and see what other people are doing. But we say, let's go look at this very, very deeply and see if it's possible. And we thought with the ride sharing model, there might be something to this. So, you know, we've been flying helicopters for some time. You can see Uber Chopper here. And in fact, we just ran uh, a promotion with Uber Chopper in Poland where we had 90,000 riders request a trip in a single week. Um, so it shows you that demand is definitely there for taking to the air. And so we asked ourselves, you know, could we just scale this helicopter offering? Could we just use helicopters and offer ride sharing in the air with helicopters? And unfortunately, we concluded the answer was no very quickly. And the reason is because, well, there's actually several reasons. One is that the helicopters are just very noisy vehicles, and communities just don't accept them. Around the world, it's played out many, many times. San Francisco, my hometown, is no, no exception. In fact, maybe the leader of this. And we have 28 heliports, of which one is active, because the community has shut these heliports down simply because they're too noisy and they disrupt their, their quiet time in their community. Um, helicopters also aren't safe enough for the kind of scale we're talking about, daily mainstream transportation. And they use turbine engines which burn, burn hydrocarbons with all of the environmental you know, implications that that entails. These engines are also very inefficient, as all combustion engines are. And the aircraft design, for the purposes of what Uber needs to do, which is go up, across, and down for transportation from point A to point B, um, they're actually not optimized aerodynamically at all. So all of this means that the operating costs are prohibitively high. So too loud, bad for the environment, too expensive uh, to operate, and not safe enough. Other than that, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? Sorry, very American joke. You guys can look it up on the web later. Um, <laughs> so anyway, for us, this is where the fun began. We started really digging in and saying, like, what can we do? How do we solve this problem? And our, our pursuit of this started with the creation of a white paper. Pretty boring stuff, but it was actually a very, very important step for us because it allowed us to do the first principles deep dive we needed to do to get to the answer. And among all the hurdles we uncovered there for bringing this to reality, the vehicle itself was one that we dug into deeply. When we published the paper a little over a year ago, we weren't sure what to expect. We weren't sure how it would be received. Uh, but it was incredibly, incredibly well received. To date, we've had over 100,000 downloads of the paper. And it's now one of, the most recent, uh, one of the most cited recent papers in the industry. We're really proud of it, actually. Um, and what we found is that we need an entirely new kind of aircraft, one that can take off and land vertically, but it has the benefits of a fixed wing plane for crews. In using fixed wing for crews gives you a three times energy efficiency win over a helicopter. This type of aircraft is called transitional because it transitions from using rotors for vertical takeoff and landing to cruising with wings. And it turns out that this kind of aircraft has actually been built before. Um, this is the Bell V-22. 
Um, so we thought, hey, maybe something like this will work. Uh, but the, you know, and, the, and we'll ignore for the moment that it burns hydrocarbons for fuel, because maybe that we could do something about that. Um, but the problem is it's even more mechanically complex than a helicopter. You've got two big engines on this thing that are driving these complex cyclic and collective hubs, this helicopter terminology, which drive the, the rotors. And unfortunately, you can't fly this aircraft with just one of these. So if either one of these, any part fails on either of these, this aircraft is not operable. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're passing on this aircraft for the, you know, for urban aviation, but it has, it, it does have incredible performance innovations and, and, you know, sort of technology innovations, and it's made it very valuable uh, to the military. Here's what we envision for Uber Air. This, like I said, is a very new kind of aircraft. You can see it here transitioning between vertical takeoff, cruise, and vertical landing. Uh, and I should note, this is just one design among many. We have a very clear performance specification for these aircraft. Uh, but within that performance specification, there's a lot of room to design different types of aircraft. This is just a, like a reference design that we've, we've put together. Um, from a safety standpoint, this has no single part criticality. That means that there's no single part that if it fails, you can't fly the aircraft. It's still safe. So how does that work? The answer to that question turns out to be the most foundational and important breakthrough technology for urban aviation, which is distributed electric propulsion, or DEP. This technology was invented by a gentleman named Mark Moore, uh, who was a 32-year NASA veteran um, and worked on the thing called the X-57 demonstrators to show this technology in action. Uh, happily, he now works on the Elevate team at Uber. And he runs our vehicle systems engineering uh, team as our, as our director of vehicle uh, systems engineering. DEP uses many small rotors with its own dedicated electric motor. This is a game changer because it allows you to do quiet, clean flight. And so when I say clean, I mean this vehicle is 100% emissions free. It's also very safe. Like I said, there's no single point of failure. And it uses a fly-by-wire system, which means that the, the pilot has much less operational complexity to deal with than a typical aircraft. This eliminates a lot of pilot error type uh, you know, problems in, in flying the aircraft. On the noise front, it uses several smaller rotors instead of one big top rotor like in a helicopter. And this gets rid of that signature, loud, low-frequency impulse sound that you get from a helicopter. Um, you also get rid of the tail rotor completely, which is another source of sound. And the, this, this combustion engine is also gone. So there's a lot of sources of sound in a helicopter that are just gone in this design. And as a result, we, we believe that these aircraft will be, no, at an absolute maximum, a quarter as loud as a helicopter, but we believe a lot quieter than that. The vertical takeoff and landing is achieved by the power of stacked lift propellers in this design. And these propellers, as you can see, tuck away to reduce the cruise drag, so they get out of the way when they're not being used. And the wingtip rotors here tilt up for takeoff and landing, and they're out of the way in this configuration for boarding and unboarding. And then they rotate 90 degrees forward when you go into cruise. And this all-electric bad boy flies 150 to 200 miles an hour. It ranges up to 60 miles on a single battery charge at launch time for us. And uh, you can imagine what this does to commutes. You can imagine the gnarliest commutes an hour, hour and a half, two hours on the ground becoming just a handful of minutes in the air. That's pretty exciting. As with all Uber products, we're obsessing from the outset to create a magical rider and pilot experience. These vehicles for us will initially be piloted. So what we've done is we've separated the passengers from the pilot for safety. But you can also see here that we've designed the cabin for comfort. This has four passenger seats and is optimized for an Uber pool-like experience, which means we need people to be able to get in and out very, very quickly and easily. They have to be able to ride in comfort. You know, there's, you see there's no middle seat like you have in commercial aircraft, the dreaded middle seat. Uh, and there's enough space for a, you know, a personal bag or a backpack. Now, our stance is that from day one, these aircraft must be all electric. We're not going to compromise on that. And the reason is because we feel like we're introducing a new mass form of transportation here. And ethically, we have to introduce something that's emissions free. And we have to com you know, combat climate change, not accelerate it. This won't be easy. But we're up to the challenge. This piece is what we consider closest to the edge of what technology is capable of today. 
So we're going to be investing heavily with a, with a collection of partners in this space, and we're working with the best companies to make this happen quickly. I mentioned earlier that we'll have a 60-mile range on a single charge. So a more typical flight will be a 25-mile flight. And to give you a sense of how this works, uh, we're going to, you know, and this includes like takeoff and landing, this will use about one-third of the battery charge. So flying from like San Francisco to Palo Alto in my hometown, or from Lisbon to Cache Cache, for example, this will be about one-third of the battery charge. Now, our partner ChargePoint, as part of the Uber Elevate network, is developing an exclusive fast charger that will replenish this battery with a flight like that in just three to four minutes. That's faster than it takes us to load and unload people from the aircraft which means that there's no operational delays for charging and no battery swapping. And by eliminating battery swapping, we elim eliminate a lot of cost and a lot of operational complexity, which means it's more reliable and lower cost for our customers. It's great for everyone. So how much will this cost for riders? Is this going to just be a luxury thing for the rich, like helicopters are kind of thought of today? Well, Uber wouldn't even build something like this if it weren't going to be for everyone. So we need a clear path to making Uber Air affordable. And our target and this is ambitious, but I think it's very achievable, is to make this less expensive than driving your own car. Like literally push a button and get a flight becomes cheaper than driving your own car. Seriously. So why, can we, why is that possible? Well, it's all the reasons listed here. First, we're going to get to an unprecedented aircraft, for, for the aircraft industry, unprecedented volume of manufacturing. And so what that's going to do is it's going to drive a lot of automation in the manufacturing, much more like automotive manufacturing than aircraft. And that drives the cost of the vehicle down dramatically. The aircraft are also, these aircraft as we're envisioning them, are very efficient. These are actually 10 times more energy efficient than helicopters, which again drives down the cost with this transition design. They need far less maintenance than other aircraft, and maintenance is a huge driver of cost in operating an aircraft. They're, they require less maintenance because they're much simpler mechanically, uh, and they have a, a ton of built-in redundancy. So if something breaks, it does, the aircraft doesn't crash. It's, it's able to, you can still fly it completely safely. And the ride-sharing model makes it so that you, you drive costs down simply through utilization, as I was talking about before. The same applies in the air. You take a vehicle and you utilize it heavily. You split that cost across riders over time. You also split that cost across riders on a single flight. We'll be using pooling from day one. So these aircraft are flying with high load factors, which means just the number of seats filled. So that virtuous cycle of you know, high demand driving, you know, utilization driving down costs, that applies here too. Now, the early days pricing will certainly not be less than the cost of driving your own car, but it's also not going to be crazy high. We think that near launch, like basically once we kind of stabilize after launch, we'll, we'll be able to offer you an Uber Air flight for the cost of an Uber X trip on the ground. You'll fly pooled, but you'll pay Uber X prices. Now, of course, for that price, you'll also move at 150 to 200 miles per hour, point A to point B with no blockers. So that's a, that's a massive value proposition. So how do we make this all happen? Well, every major innovation requires someone to step in and lead the charge. And that's a natural for Uber because this is right down the middle with our mission to crack the code on urban mobility. So what exactly are we doing in this? Well, most important, we're bringing a ready and waiting market. We have 65 million monthly actives, as I mentioned, who are ready to push a button and get a flight today. This reduces the fear that this revolution will never materialize. And that reduction in fear drives a market, drives investment, drives activity. We bring a very clear mission profile. I'm starting to use aviation lingo now that I'm in the aviation world. Um, and, th and what I mean by that is that we know exactly what, these, what the aircraft and the infrastructure have to do. And as a result, we can design in a very purpose-built way a, an aircraft perfect for the mission and, and, and you know, sky ports and other infrastructure that are perfect for our particular problem. And for every aspect that's required to make Elevator reality, we're partnering. We have, to, we have you know, the battery and charging tech I mentioned. We have the Skyport infrastructure. We have airspace management. We're taking point to bring the right partners to the table to crack the code on those things. The group that we've created, these partners, we call the Uber Elevate Network. And in April of this year, we had our first Uber Elevate Network summit. Um, and we announced partnerships with five top vehicle manufacturers. Over time, we, we envision a very robust VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing, aircraft uh, design space, a landscape. Numerous uh, you know, diverse designs. And actually, this is a very good thing, because if we have multiple different types of aircraft flying on the network, and something goes wrong with one type of the aircraft, and that aircraft has to be grounded, uh, the other aircraft can still fly. That's very important for the reliability of this network. 
Now, we're working closely with each partner to fast track the development of their aircraft. Um, and these aircraft will, of course, operate on fixed routes. I mentioned skyports. They'll fly from point A to point B at these new types of heliports called skyports. And in April, we, we announced our, our first real estate partnership with a developer named Hillwood Properties in Texas. And they've begun work building their first skyport. And they have a $1.8 billion project in Texas called Frisco Station. And this is in Frisco, Texas. And they're adding Uber Elevate skyports, exclusive use for the Uber Elevate network, into that design. And that work has begun, the development and build work. And they have plans to build several more sites out by 2020. There's been a, a bunch of other developments in the past couple of months. In August, Embraer, who's one of our aircraft development partners, opened an innovation center near our headquarters in San Francisco, uh, in Silicon Valley, and they signaled their intentions to invest in, the whole, in, in any tech in the uh, Uber Elevate arena. And as with other partners, we've been collaborating very closely with them on their design program. And here you can see our, uh, our CEO and their CEO, um, Dara, our CEO, and Paulo Cesar, their CEO, getting together in Brazil just a couple weeks ago, or I guess the last week. Boeing, in the meantime, announced that it's acquiring Aurora, um, one of our uh, vehicle development partners as well. And this brings b billions of dollars of potential investment capital into the, into the uh, industry. And they, entered, they bought Aurora specifically to get into the eVTOL space and the autonomous space. So that's extremely exciting as well. Now, the eVTOL programs uh, we've, uh, that so far around us have announced $125 million of private financial market investment. This is all pretty recent stuff. Um, you'll, you'll hear about a lot of it during the Web Summit. Um, and there's much more of this on the way. So we're tremendously excited about the energy in this space. Uh, people's passions are aligning in a big way to bring urban mobility uh, vision to reality. So the next logical thing to talk about is Blade Runner, obviously. Um, <laughs> for the sci-fi geeks in the room, like me, that was a very natural transition, I assure you. Um, in all seriousness, I was actually watching the new Blade Runner movie uh, just a few weeks ago, and I, and I, and I was you know, excited about the ubiquitous flying cars in the movie, and it inspired me to go back to the 1982 original edition of the movie to see what it predicted with flying cars. Um, and by the way, I hate the term flying cars, but I'm using it a lot. Sorry about that. Um, and it showed, it showed flying cars uh, going live or live in Los Angeles in 2019, which is kind of funny, actually. Um, because I, you know, that actually brings me to one of my announcements today, which is that uh, Uber Air is coming to Los Angeles, and we're doing so in 2020. So Blade Runner was only off by one year, which is pretty impressive for a 1982 prediction. And we've selected LA as our uh, second US city and plan to hold flight demonstrations there um, in a little over two years. Um, so we're really allowing, this is kind of you know, elegant, we're allowing air taxis to emerge from the Hollywood movie sets to the LA skies. Launching in LA is a really big deal. Um, this is at 13 million people and growing. LA is the second largest metro area in the United States and the 14th largest in the world. Um, earlier this year, the LA Times reported via INRIX data that it's also the most congested city on Earth. And it's worth pointing out from an overall ride-sharing perspective that 14% of the land in LA County is dedicated to parking. That's one and a half times the amount dedicated to actually driving. And it's 18.6 million parking spots. That's over three parking spots per car in the city. To get a sense of the problem, here's an aerial visual. Um, this is traffic leaving Dodger Stadium after game one of baseball's World Series just uh, three weeks ago. As I said at the start, this is going to get much worse, not better, without a major intervention. So in a world where you can fly over LA traffic, that sounds pretty appealing. At scale, we're going to have tens of thousands of flights each day across the city, giving people their time back. At a macro level, this means more free time, increased productivity, which means growth for the region's economy. And by the Olympics uh, in 2028, which is coming uh, to LA, we, we predict that residents will be making heavy use of Uber Air showcasing one of the most advanced transportation systems in the world. Just like in Dallas, we're going to need to build out a network of skyports in LA. And we're proud to announce a partner, our first partner in the Uber Elevate network there, Sandstone Properties. They have 20 uh, strategically located locations for skyports that will be dedicated exclusively to the Uber Elevate network. And we'll start with four of those at Los Angeles International Airport, downtown LA, Santa Monica, and Sherman Oaks. You'll be able to arrive by 8 p.m. At, at, at an event like a concert, a Beyonce concert, an LA Lakers game, if after arriving at LAX at just 7.30 p.m., instead of spending an hour and a half on the road uh, you know, in traffic, stuck, waiting, to, you're probably missing the event. And to consummate all this LA love, we're also doing our next Elevate Summit in LA. So we'd love to see you there. That'll be in the spring. 
So one last partner announcement today, uh, and this, this uh, partner needs no announcement, or no introduction, even on the uh, world stage, and it's NASA. Uh, this is home, you know, NASA's been home to some of the most uh, advanced technical innovation in the world, and it's definitely the center of innovation for the, the United States government. Um, these are exactly the kind of partners we need uh, in order to make Uber Air a reality. We've signed a Space Act agreement with, with uh, NASA, which is a formalization of a partnership to work on airspace management. Airspace is going to be a big deal for Elevate because we need to handle a lot more air traffic flying overseas than has ever been done before. We need a foundational reboot of the airspace system. And with NASA's cooperation, we'll work with the FAA, airports, we'll be able to actually introduce this quickly and grow it into a completely new, very autonomous uh, air transport system based on their technology called UTM, which is Unmanned Aerial Systems Traffic Management. I'm really excited to work with NASA on this. So I know this is a ton to digest. And it's really, really hard to just listen you know, in sort of the abstract about this. So I'd like to show you something for the first time ever. Actually, uh, Web Summit's going to see this. It's a visualization of the Uber Air experience, a day in the life. And I should, I should point out, while well, this is going to go by pretty fast, this is a condensed version of the video. Um, there's an immense amount of technical detail in this video. That, there's a lot of technical correctness. It's all technically very accurate about the way it will actually be. Um, and as a teaser, I challenge you all to figure out where the passengers, when they're getting on the aircraft, are weighed. So I'm going to leave you with that. Um, enjoy the video, and thank you so much for your time. <laughs> 